has a failed receiver uh, and, and a sick backup receiver. That's the most serious problem on board that spacecraft. The way we communicate with the, uh, with the Voyager spacecraft is that we send commands to the spacecraft, a series of digital bits in computer language that go to the spacecraft, and it's the language that the spacecraft underst understands. These bits are transmitted from ground stations uh, located around the Earth, what we call the Deep Space Network. The three Deep Space Network stations are located uh, in Goldstone, California, outside of Madrid, Spain, and outside of Canberra, Australia. As the Earth turns, we can maintain commu continuous communication with a point in space, the spacecraft. In turn, there's kind of the reverse link coming back down. The information that the spacecraft gathers goes into a transmitter on the spacecraft. It's transmitted into those big ears on the ground of the Deep Space Network and transmitted back then on the ground to our control facility here in Pasadena. The uh, transmitter on Voyager is like tens of watts. It's like 20 watts, less power than an average uh, light bulb on your front porch uh, might uh, consume. On the other hand, when that signal is received on the Earth, it is literally a tiny, tiny fraction of a watt that uh, is received. The amount of power received by the ground antennas is something like a billionth of the amount of power used by my digital watch. Man has known about the planet Jupiter ever since he took a good look at the night sky. It's not what you'd call a near neighbor, though, being more than 400 million miles away. But after all these centuries, we're getting a closer look than we've ever had. When Voyager got up close and we looked at the time-lapse movies of the atmosphere in motion, things were changing every day. Little storms would pop up out of nowhere and they'd get ripped apart dispersed all in a day or two. And that made the mystery of the great red spot and those other large spots even deeper because how could they last for so long in the midst of all that chaotic motion? It was a startling discovery. As uh, Voyager approached uh, Jupiter, the first thing that it inter intercepted was what's called the bow shock. That's a shock where the supersonic solar wind becomes subsonic. And that shock, the solar wind velocity, which is a million miles per hour, abruptly decreases to 250,000 miles per hour. That abrupt change in velocity causes the ionized gas to vibrate. And we can sense, we can hear the shock, and we can hear the vibrations associated with that shock as the spacecraft flew through the shock itself. We had expected that the magnetic field might extend something like uh, a, a million miles or so from the planet. In fact, it extends some three to four million miles from the planet. Now we understand because Io is injecting into the magnetic field some one to two tons of material every second. And that material, as it spins with Jupiter, is centrifugally expanding Jupiter's magnetic field but inflating it to a much larger size than it would normally be. We expected, quite frankly, the uh, uh, satellites of the outer solar system to be quite bland and geologically lifeless. As we uh, flew closer, uh, Io looked less and less like anything we'd ever, ever seen. The impact craters turned into uh, irregular dark patterns and the colored uh, uh, patches, red, yellows, painted on the surface. As a matter of fact, as we flew closer, uh, we saw nothing at all that resembled an impact crater. And Voyager 1 discovered uh, 11 active volcanoes and nine of those were still active when Voyager 2 returned four months later. I think the, the, the event in the, uh, in the mission which really altered our view and our expectation for the rest of the mission was the discovery of the volcanoes on Isle. Uh, that was such a dramatic and unexpected thing to find that it really told us that we could no longer be complacent. We could no longer expect to understand or anticipate what we were really going to see. Voyager 1 flew in close to Io for a close-up flyby of Io to give good return from Io uh, and made its close encounters with the Galilean satellites after the closest approach of Jupiter. If we look at Callisto, 
It's one of the most heavily cratered objects in the solar system, virtually saturated with impact craters. When we looked at Ganymede, we find um, two kinds of terrains. One is a terrain that looks very much like Callisto, but in addition, Ganymede has a, a uh, very complex uh, intersecting network of faults uh, in a younger terrain, which has evidently welled up from the interior and replaced these, this old cratered terrain that's so similar to Callisto. In the case of Europa, we see yet another style. We see gargantuan fault patterns in which this uh, ocean has frozen repeatedly, broken open, and fluids float up to the surface producing dark puddles of material within the faults. These are then broken again, so there's intersecting uh, and uh, cross-cutting networks. There were two small satellites discovered at Jupiter. Uh, one of them found orbiting just outside a very thin, tenuous ring of material that was uh, discovered at Jupiter. The imaging team members planned one single photo, uh, an 11 minute exposure that would be taken as the spacecraft plunged through the equator plane of Jupiter. And it just so happened that there was a ring there. Uh, it's dusty and there it seems to be no indication of uh, water or ice um, within the ring, so it's probably made out of rocky material. An outer space spectacular that was the stuff of dreams only a generation ago began snapping into the sharp focus of reality today. After its billion-mile journey from Earth, the Voyager 1 spacecraft sent back pictures of man's closest look yet at the ring planet Saturn. The closest encounter of spacecraft and planet occurs later tonight when Voyager sails just 77,000 miles from Saturn's yellow clouds. But already one scientist said, in the strange world of Saturn's rings, the bizarre has become commonplace. The closer that Voyager got to Saturn, the more and more detail and structure Saturn's rings turned out to have. And this just was an enormous surprise to everybody. The rings were simultaneously breathtaking but completely baffling. And there was just far more structure than people had anticipated. Not only did we find many, many concentric features within the rings, but we found eccentric rings. We found uh, that the F ring, which had been discovered by Pioneer, had braids in it and kinks and clumps, all these things no one had ever even dreamed about before Voyager got to Saturn. And then, of course, there were the spokes that Voyager discovered about a month or a month and a half before encounter. Uh, and these are these radial features in the B-ring that come and go. They are seen orbiting um, around the rings. And uh, no one had a clue, or at least not a, uh, not a reasonable clue in the beginning as to what caused these features or even what they were, that if you look at the rings of Saturn for a period of time and watch the spokes go around and round and you examine the appearance of the spokes on the rings, that appearance changes and it changes with a period that is equal to the period of the spin of Saturn's magnetic field. Voyager found that Saturn's magnetic field